Thanks very much for the opportunity to take part in this uh, symposium, which I think is a, a really good idea. Um, okay, I can do this. So the key points I wanted to... Oh, I just... Uh, yeah, okay, thank you. The key points I will, I'll be coming back to uh, and going through are that alcohol and other drug services are experiencing an ageing of our existing client base, an influx of older clients. They're much more complex with a lot of comorbidities and other problems that may and have different patterns of use compared to our traditional client base. And there are particular challenges for the provision of alcohol and drug services, which I'll be talking about. The clinical challenges address medical issues, cognitive issues, psychosocial, and very importantly, uh, issues about risk assessment and harm reduction. Now, there is a little bit of overlap between, uh, I think, all of the presenters, myself uh, sadly included, but I do think that that is so, almost in some ways a good thing and that we can really highlight the main messages. And for those of you not really familiar with this area, you should be able to uh, leave here with some clear things in your mind. Um, in preparing this talk, I thought I would pull out our local data um, and our hospital network is uh, two large teaching hospitals and two small hospitals. So even though it's not a national data set, it, it is still something that covers, draws on a population of about half a million citizens and two large hospitals. And what we can see is that uh, the future uh, started five years ago in that we already have a, a uh, statistically significant ageing. And if we look here at the percentage of our inpatients admitted under the addiction team in the last five years, it's, it's gone up more than five years. Now, you know, you can only age one year at a time, but the point being that we are selecting out older people for admission, and so we're already seeing that ageing. I think the other point I'd make from this slide is that the percentages here are around the 20 to 25. So in terms of drug and alcohol and addiction, we still very much operate with a majority of much younger people than the rest of the healthcare system. But the percentage who are old is rising quite quickly. Um, now, I, I've put the two hospitals separately because they're not, they don't have the same model of care. The RPA is an acute uh, short-stay admissions which is ba nearly entirely driven by emergency department presentations who have to be admitted. And that group of people, as you can see, is a few years older than the Concord service, which is an elective drug and alcohol detoxification, rehabilitation type service, which still more has more of your regular um, 20 to 40 year old drug and alcohol user. Our in, our, what a, this is showing the length of stay over the last five years according to age in the RPA service. And the numbers go bounce all over the place a bit, but I think there's a very clear demonstration that the length of stay is a lot longer in people as they get older. So in the people in their uh, young adult years, the average length of stay is around the two days. When they get old, you're looking at six, six to eight days. It's a three times longer length of stay. It's a very substantial prolongation of the average length of stay. And older people tend to have multiple comorbidities such as diabetes, heart failure, uh, chest disease. They tend to be on multiple medications and to use more OTC medications and to present with non-specific as well as specific symptoms. And Professor Drape has already made that point that you, it's not so easy to identify patients whose overall pattern of symptoms is kind of similar to the patient in the next bed who does not have those problems. And there's one person in the room who has seen this slide before because he wrote it. Yeah. <laughs> I, we, we have to acknowledge our sources. <laughs> so that's Dr. Apo de Mercol, who's a colleague I work with. And we gave a talk about drug and alcohol use in older people three years ago. And I did share some of the love. Um, so the inpatient concerns we're seeing is really the complexity of the comorbidities. Most of the patients we see, not some, but most of them have a, a significant delirium, severe cognitive dysfunction, 
these are people when you give them the MMSC test to do the page, they turn the page upside down. And I mean, these are really severely disturbed uh, people. That classically, we're looking at whether they are, whether it is legally safe to let them go home alone, or whether they need guardianship orders. Um, we have a lot of homeless, exit-blocked patients with placement problems. So patients that, after they're medically stabilised, there's nowhere for them to go. Um, mobility is such a concern that we have an increasing number with falls, even while they're in hospital and under fairly uh, close nursing care. Problems with stairs, with a need to modify wards and residential services, so that um, one of our services has some stairs inside it, and they, we can't we can't use that service for older patients. So, so this ageing population has implications for how our services are built, never mind how they're run. I just want to give you one patient that nearly drove us all spare, who was aged about 60. Uh, he had an extended hospital stay of 60 days. And in plain language, that means we have to can the hospital has to cancel 15 other admissions that would have taken an average of four days each. So it's a very major impact because at that time of the year we had four patients um, and we had to park them in different parts of the wards because the nurses it had such an impact on the ward that the nurses uh, wouldn't do it. Um, major problem of duty of care, unable to discharge the patient who was bed blocked. Um, and indeed, that patient, the care of such patients uh, below age 65 is not funded by Commonwealth Aid Services, so we cannot place them in aged care facilities. And increasingly in an activity-based funding ABF ho acute hospital framework, it's also not covered, not funded by the hospital. So they'll have their first four or five days or whatever it is of care funded by the hospital under the ABF framework. But if we can't move them on, we wear the financial liability and we are not funded to treat them. So nobody wants these patients. All levels of government refuse to take them and the only reason they stay in the hospital, to be blunt, is that we have a legal duty of care. If we, uh, if we put them out on the street, uh, they'd either die or we'd get sued. Uh, or they'd die and we'd get sued. <laughs> um, so, so, I mean, this is um, one of the pressure points in our healthcare system. And what is not often under accepted is that the consequence, it's not just a, a well, uh, the consequence is five to 10 beds in most hospitals are uh, blocked. Um, and this patient, no social support, he was insightless to his disorder, and in particular, he's insightless into his uh, lack of capacity for self-care. So he thinks he's kind of OK. Um, very difficult nursing problem with an absconding risk and code black, meaning um, acute violence risk inside the hospital. And that means that he needs, not only do we have to look after him in the hospital, but because it's an unsuitable environment, it's incredibly costly with one-to-one, 24-hour-a-day -one, nursing. So he's getting, he's using the, the beds for 15 admissions and he's using the nursing care for uh, perhaps double that number, let's say 30. Um, diagnoses, alcohol related brain damage and he was also opiate dependent with some chronic pain. He'd had some falls and broken something. Um, nothing particularly uh, striking and, and stable. So it was a really sad and difficult case that we don't quite have a system to deal with. Uh, so what is the solution? Uh, I suggested we look at undertaking um, clinical redesign in our institution, but I think this is a, a national issue, to improve in inpatient addiction medicine services, because most hospitals don't even have one, to establish addiction medicine units in the larger hospitals, to strengthen consultation liaison services uh, broadly, and to build the community links and the ambulatory care services required to reduce readmission. Um, and you're not mainly hospital-based people, but why focus on hospitals? Well, there was a guy called Sutton who was uh, went up before the court uh, in Scotland for his sixth armed robbery from a bank in a row. And the judge said, why? Do you keep robbing the banks? And he said, 
because that's where the money is. <laughs> Why do we focus on hospitals? Because that's where the sick people are. And extraordinarily, so often in um, health planning processes, the hospitals are considered to be, uh, we don't have to worry about the hospitals, they're covered. I had presented this information about uh, patterns of substance use as we get older, um, and Anne Roche has presented this data basically, but really just wanted to make the, restate the point that as people get older, they are more likely to be using alcohol on a daily basis, every day. But the alcohol use disorders, as we, alcohol dependence, is actually a disease of young people. So our, our perception of this as basically being a young person's problem is, is overall correct. Uh, and the, the modal age of onset for an alcohol use disorder is 18, which is, of course, the age at which you can legally buy the stuff. And if we look at the prevalence of an alcohol use disorder, there's a very striking gender difference of approximately two or even three to one uh, more frequent in men than women. And although that, 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 age, that gender difference is narrowing over the years, it's still quite uh, significantly present. And a very striking decline with age, such that older women are much, much less likely to have an alcohol problem than, let's say, young men. But the, because the, the number of old people is growing so rapidly, even an uncommon disorder in old people starts to become more common. On the prescription opiate uh, use, which Anne has also mentioned, I wanted to say that we are in fact spoilt for choice with the number of different preparations that you can go out there and buy with a prescription. It has gone from a less than 10 um, in 1992, 20 odd years ago, now to being more than 70. There are more than 70 opiate preparations. And whilst Anne has already highlighted the dramatic increase in opiate use, I want to highlight that all psychoactive drug use has escalated dramatically over the last generation of you know, four, five and eight-fold increases in all the classes of, of, of these drugs. Benzodiazepines is the only class of drug that has not gone up, but given that most Australians are so pilled out, we might wonder why it hasn't gone down, because Professor Draper has reminded us there's basically no indication for the use of these drugs uh, beyond a few weeks and about 80% of prescriptions are for patients who've been taking them for more than six months. And in fact, I would challenge Professor Draper that the main reason that people prescribe these drugs is actually uh, dependence. The main indication for prescribing is the fact that the patient's already been taking it for a long period of time. I won't say a great deal about cannabis because Anne's already made the point I wanted to make. I just wanted to talk a little bit about um, patterns of uh, treatment utilisation in my local health district. Um, that's New South Wales and on the right hand side is our district which covers just over half a million people and you can see it's sort of inner west of Sydney. And what we've seen in the last f five to seven years is that that escalation of age has already uh, very much taken place but again working from a low base, because the majority of our clients are still young. But the, the percentage of people aged greater than 50 who present for treatment of an illicit drug use, which was as low as 5% in 2007, is now about 20%. That's a dramatic shift. And although it's one local health district, it's not national data, the numbers of people we're talking about is on the bottom of the slide, and it's, you know, it's, it's all around the 3,000 mark. So it is based on a substantial number of patients. So that's a very significant shift that's already, had, already happened. And in, the, in relation to the total, and the main difference there is alcohol, the shift is not quite as marked. To break it down by age, the, these, this graph shows the red line is alcohol, which has gone up less, but it's gone up. 
um, cannabis, the average, the proportion who are age greater than 50 for cannabis has gone from around the 10 to over 35%. So it's a dramatic increase in older, uh, older weed smokers coming forward for treatment. Um, opioids is, uh, has gone from about 5 to about 20 and amphetamines has gone from uh, less than 5 to about 15%. Uh, so a near, uh, it was exclusively for, for very you know, young, aggressive men, and now we're really seeing amphetamine use in, in older people. I was a bit surprised, as an exception, that the proportion of older people presenting for sedative or benzodiazepine problems actually seems to have not shifted. Um, so that summary of that data is that we've got overall ageing. The great majority of clients of a, of a, a recognised specialist drug and alcohol service is still younger people, but the ageing effect is greatest for opioids, cannabis and alcohol. Recognition and diagnosis is problematic at all ages. There's going to be a whole presentation on it, so I'm just going to give you like two or three points and hopefully just a couple of bullet points. Um, older people tend to minimise substance use history. We do not routinely screen for it. We have a lower index of suspicion at a clinical level. One might wonder why, but we, well, we shouldn't, clearly, but we do. Um, we are more understanding of people who use substances in the context of, of difficult life circumstances, perhaps a bereavement and the like. We are less likely to refer older patients to specialised services. Uh, the formal, formal substance use diagnoses and the formal diagnostic tools are not validated uh, in older aged people who are different, who have those comorbid other presentations and whose use and consequences may be different. Um, and who does urine drug screening tests on 75 year olds? It's, it's, it's just not something we're going to do. Although I am now. Um, <laughs> Now that, I've, now that I've read my own slides. <laughs> um, so there's a bunch of clinical red flags that we would think about, but I just highlight at the bottom there, the patient, classic patient, someone who improves quickly in hospital but reappears in multiple readmissions is, is something that we do face quite often. Um, neglect of this set of issues is quite prominent even in informal government documents and statements. Alcohol is mentioned as a decreasing problem in age in this study of the demographic profile published by the Australian Institute of Health and Welfare, and there was no mention of illicit drug use in older people at all. This is a paper in, in, uh, in a general practice journal for the elderly, published three years ago about how to fall, prevent falls in young, excuse me, not in young, preventing falls in older adults. Benzodiazepine problem and reduction and how to get people off it was, was well described. The word alcohol did not appear in the article at all, uh, nor did the words opiates. So the concept, and, and the reason I highlight this, and I mean there's plenty of bad articles out there, but this article was written by very high prestigious people with NHMRC fellowships and grants. One positive thing about screening is that uh, the gamma GT level, the blood test that we often use, is actually fairly useless in very young people, but it actually becomes more useful in older people, particularly those who are overweight and male. So the, the average level of the GGT, oh, this I should be using here, normal is around the uh, 40 or 50. So in those that are drinking heavily, you can see it goes up in the older people. The, People under 20, age under 20, no matter, even those drinking at the highest levels, their GGT level was normal and therefore using that blood test to screen for an alcohol problem is completely useless. It will almost never be positive. But we're talking today about older people and in that group of people uh, the test is quite useful. So actually uh, that's a useful positive 
Firstly, because it's more likely to show something, and secondly, because older people have blood tests and go to doctors much more than young people. So that's a positive. Um, alcohol dependence, in fact, in a recent study from a German, a European study from Jürgen Rem, he found that GPs actually were making diagnoses of alcohol problems when they saw them in primary care, but they weren't treating it. <laughs> so the great challenge is firstly to diagnose it, but to move from diagnosis to treatment, to you know, doing something about it. And in fact, there's a therapeutic gap which we recognise in medicine. Uh, and another example of that published in a major journal three or four years ago was that only 25% of patients with a recognised high blood pressure actually had treatment for that disorder. So there's a kind of a natural tendency in medicine to see something, note it, and then see it again and note it again, as opposed to deal with it decisively. Um, we've talked on that, sorry, risk factors. Some of this is, there's a bit of overlap. I just wanted to make mention about the ageing uh, uh, um, opiate treatment program population. As people age, we find they have fewer behavioural problems, fewer psychiatric problems, but more medical problems related to their drug use, other substance use and lifestyle, such as obesity, smoking, bloodborne viruses. And this challenges us, because how's our methadone program actually designed? It's actually designed for 30-year-old naughty people. It's, the focus is on behavioural management and not, not abusing takeaways and not punching the nurses, which is an entirely good focus if that's the problem. But there's typically limited medical engagement we refer patients out to their GP, uh, inver in inverted commas, because two thirds of them don't have what, a GP. Um, or even if they have a GP, it's a methadone GP where the care is highly, I've said, focused, that is limited to writing methadone scripts. And so, so comprehensive primary care is not often happening. We need to rethink this by clinically redesigning our services. Um, and what we can see from this particular study is that as patients age, the liver mortality from the patients with hepatitis B and C is all in people over the age of 50. The drug and alcohol related deaths, which are in red, kind of disappear and get taken over. So once we start to see patients for long enough, the major causes of death for people on methadone in the first, when they're young, uh, are sort of suicide, trauma and drug overdose. But after 30 years, those problems, they don't entirely go away actually, but they're completely dominated by cancer um, and um, cancer and, and liver, liver failure, cancer and liver deaths. And they are the sort of medical complications of, long, of, of drug dependence early in life. Um, I just skipped over the stuff about poly, polypharmacy and being on lots of medications. Firstly, because Anne's mentioned it, and secondly, we've got something on it this afternoon. But the key thing, point I wanted to make here is that there's an incredibly close correlation between the number of prescribers and the number of drugs a person's going to be taking. It's almost a straight line. So if you want people to take less drugs, they've got to see less doctors. They can see the same doctor repeatedly, but not... And what do older people do? They see a cardiologist, and then they see a GP, and then they don't like, et cetera. So they see, and so seeing multiple doctors is not necessarily in the same class of doctor. There might be different specialties. Um, solutions, improving diagnostic assessment. We have to reduce the number of prescribers that our patients are seeing. We can only do that. We can only do that with integration of care, where, uh, the complex needs of the patient are, are uh, managed in a single, by a single team. That's a particular challenge in Australia compared to other countries where we can, under Medicare funding, we can go off and see any doctor we like, uh, whereas in the United Kingdom you can't. So our system facilitates doctor shopping, whereas other systems inhibit it. We have to consider substance use alongside the other healthcare needs of the patients, and I've listed a few of the common problems. 
And we have to design a healthcare system that it can achieve that, because we don't have that at the moment, in terms of a workforce, in terms of a role um, identity, understanding that if I work in this clinic, I still have to provide comprehensive care, have to change the way we think as doctors. And the partnerships we have, we have to partner up with aged care. I've tried to do it. It's not necessarily incredibly easy. Um, we don't have drug and alcohol problems here. And when we do, the patients don't want to do anything about it anyway. I don't really see how your service could help. They either stop or they don't stop. OK, we'll keep a log of the issues. And I never heard from the guy in seriously a year. So being willing to uh, partner requires uh, two partners and some motivation on the other side of the table. And that's, that's a very great challenge. And quite cunningly, that's why we're here today. So thank you for the organisers. Um, what can be recommended? Of course, a continued focus. Integration of care sounds like a good idea, but I don't know how feasible it really is in practice. Will services that have failed to engage with these problems do so now because we think it's a good idea? One approach may be uh, in, in, to increase our active partnerships between the specialist services that do exist, to start talking to each other, develop projects, um, educate each other, talk to each other more and to look at how we design our large-scale systems, our hospitals and our health services around the place to address these problems more comprehensively. Thanks. <laughs>